my cousin had a uh, science project and he collected pupu, the, 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 the kahuli, the land snail. And they have the most beautiful coloring. And it's just said that they sing. And what really happens though is when they move to the edge of a leaf, when the breeze is blowing, it catches in their shell and it, it, it hums, it whistles. It does make a sound. It's a lovely sound. We didn't know at the time that they would become endangered. And he has a collection now of several hundred shells. And he called me the other day from Maui, he lives on Maui. And he was kind of picking my brain. What should I do with this collection? And, you know, we, we thought about Bishop Museum, but they have quite a few big collection already. I said, find a school on Maui and continue the story there. Yeah. Wow. And then don't, don't keep them in your house because now everybody no. knows he has them. No. Well, now everybody knows he has them, but they all tell a story. And I'm so glad because I was up in the range uh, a, f a few years ago and the Kohuli blessed the Nature Conservancy and their project up there to shelter them and make sure that they continue to live. They're so beautiful in the wild. So all of these outdoor experiences, um, uh, you know, just kind of made who I am today. Sabra Koka experienced many different cultures living around the world as the daughter of an army officer and then the wife of an Air Force pilot. She was enjoying her career as a photojournalist in Alaska when the calling of her native Hawaiian community brought her home. She landed on Kauai, where her knowledge and care for the environment and perpetuation of Native Hawaiian traditions have made her a respected cultural leader of the community. Sabra Kauka of Kauai, next on Long Story Short. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox is Hawaii's first weekly television program produced and broadcast in high definition. Aloha mai kako, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Sabra Kauka is the go-to person on Kauai for almost anything to do with Hawaiian culture. She's a master kapa maker and kumuhula, and she's called on as an expert in natural resource management, be it marine mammal protection, preservation of historic sites, or ethnobotany. She will even bless your home or new canoe. But Sabra Kauka was not always a Hawaiian cultural practitioner. For much of her early life, she lived away from Hawaii in places with very different cultures. Dad was in the Army. He was uh, uh, at the university when World War II broke out, and so then he had to join the service, and he joined the Army and became an officer. And so we lived all over the world. It was really a wonderful experience. I didn't realize how unusual it was until I came home and met people who had never left Oahu. Where did you live? Dad's first assignment was in Bremerhaven, uh, Germany. And the cool thing is that I, I am still in touch by Facebook with the granddaughter of a woman who was our nanny there. She's still alive. She was my mother's age. She's in her 90s. And after Bremerhaven, we were, Dad was assigned to San Francisco. And we lived at Fort Mason at the end of Van Ness Avenue. And my brother and I went to school there. And then after that, uh, Dad was assigned to uh, Saigon, Vietnam, and we lived there for a few years. So a couple of years ago, I went back to Vietnam, and my guide found the old house that we lived in. It was amazing. It was still in really good shape. Following Vietnam, Dad was assigned to the Pentagon in Washington, D.C., and we lived in Chevy Chase, Maryland, a beautiful area. And then after that, there was a reduction in force, and we moved home to Hawaii. What was your family life like as a kid? Phenomenal, really, really phenomenal. I didn't know how great my family life was until high school years, and I'd bring friends home, and they'd say, wow. You know, they'd look around, they'd look at all the, they just, because uh, they didn't have that kind of support. You know, so it wasn't really until high school or college that I realized that not everybody had the support that I did. What kind as of support? A, youngster. Um, a safe place, a home, you know, uh, food, uh, education, adventure. Because wherever we moved in the world, uh, it was an adventure. They enjoyed traveling, they enjoyed my parents, they enjoyed learning, they enjoyed going to all these great different places. And they made it an adventure for us as well. But they were also very cognizant of the community around them. Um, my dad's first assignment after World War II was in Germany, post-war Germany. And 
I think it was integral to him as a Hawaiian to feed people. And he brought people home for dinner. My mom never really always knew who was coming home for dinner. And one particular family that he invited home for dinner, they returned the next day with some of the most beautiful crystal ever. And wherever you lived, your family went outside a lot. They were outdoorsy. Yeah, we did. Very outdoorsy because when we lived in San Francisco, we went camping up in the Sierras and that's the first camping trip I can remember that is really cold but really fun and catching trout in the stream and cooking it on a over a campfire and the trout was as big as the pan. Yeah, good fun stuff. So ever since then I've I've loved it. I mean, I love the outdoors. I love camping. You're comfortable hiking. in very with, comfortable with uh, just a few things around you very to make Very few things. Yeah, minimal. Did uh, did your family even go uh, hiking in Germany? Oh yeah. Skiing in fact tobogganing, skiing. I was still pretty young, but I can remember uh, the skiing and tobogganing and the snow activities in, in the Alps. And what about back here in Hawaii? Our recreation was either in the mountains, hiking in the mountains with my uncle, Elmer Williamson, or uh, playing at the beach, like down at Queens and canoes and surfing. Mom and Dad were uh, both University of Hawaii graduates in the early 30s, I guess, in the 30s. And um, it was always emphasized that we would get our educations and graduate. So where did you decide to go? I was uh, first at Oregon. I went to Linfield College for a couple of years, and then I wanted to major in anthropology. They didn't offer it there, so I came home to University of Hawaii here at Manoa. And why anthropology? It just put together everything that I was interested in. I was interested in different cultures. I was interested in different people and I had a lot of questions. And you'd had a lot of experience watching people from around the world. Oh, to the max, yes. So that, so you did graduate with a degree in anthropology? I did. Kauka means doctor. Does that mean Kauka you come means from doctor. a line of doctors? I come from a line of uh, traditional healers, and the name Kauka, though, was uh, given to them when they lived in Waipio Valley. And uh, I have a Chinese grandfather who very quickly learned la'au, lapa'au, or Hawaiian medicinal herbs. And people came to him to be healed. And they called him Kauka, Lao, Dr. Lao. And from then on, his sons all became called Kauka. You, have you gone into healing at all? Just a bit. Um, I studied with Lavon Ohai for a year. Uh, and I, I grow the herbs, I grow the plants that I need for some basic healing, like olena, like mamaki, and uh, uhaloa, I know where to find it, you know. Um, I haven't done as much as maybe I should in that area, and to explore it a little more, continue it. After finishing college, Sabra Koka got married and once again left Hawaii, eventually settling in Alaska to raise her family and pursue a career. She was in a remote village in Alaska when she saw a newspaper article about the Hawaiian people. That changed her life. I was married then in uh, 67, and my husband at the time was, uh, uh, this was during the Vietnam era. When the Vietnam War came along, he also was had to join the service, so he went into the Air Force and became a pilot. And we lived in various places uh, up on North America over these years, uh, eventually ending up in Alaska for 14 years. I know you were raising two children. Yes. You also uh, became a photojournalist along the way. I did because I was looking for a way that I could make a living uh, as an as a Air Force wife because you move every couple of years and um, still be able to stay at home, take care of my children too. And I found that, uh, well, I had a friend who was uh, editing a magazine. She said, can you do a story on something? And I said, sure. So I started writing, started publishing. And every time I wrote and published, they'd want photographs to go with it. So then I'd start providing the photographs and then very quickly learned that one photograph it can bring in a lot of lot more money than maybe a story can, even though the story takes time, takes effort, takes refinement, takes skill. They both do. That was both a good fields. call. It's, that it's not what you do now at all. No, no, it isn't. But uh, what happened was in 1983, there was a 
Native Hawaiian Studies Commission report that was published. It came out in Associated Press around the world. But in Alaska, there was a, uh, there was a fantastic AP writer called Ward Sims. And Ward uh, it, it expanded on this uh, report. And it came out on the front page of a native newspaper. And I was working in the bush at the time. I was working in Lower Kuskokwim uh, River Delta, photographing the, the salmon processing ship. And there were Japanese on this ship who totally pre-purchase all of the salmon roe, and they treated it like gold because it was worth quite a bit of money. But as I'm sitting there on the on 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 the dock of a little uh, native store, reading the story about Hawaii, about the poor condition of native Hawaiians in Hawaii, I said, "What happened to everybody? What do you mean?" And so it talked about the high rate of high school dropouts, um, teenage pregnancies. Uh, diabetes and cancer, high blood pressure, all of these things. And I went, oh, yeah, that's right, isn't it? Not all of my cousins had the opportunity or the support to continue on to college, like I was, quote, required to do, expected to do, supported to do. And no, oh, that's right, my grandmother had diabetes, you know? So then I began to turn around and look at very closely at things that were happening in Hawaii. Um, and it just, it just goes to show the power of a written or a spoken word, the power of words, because uh, that was a turning point for me, is reading that article and beginning to inquire what happened in Hawaii. Because it's hard to believe now, but in the 60s, I don't feel that we were really taught the true facts of history, of what happened here in the islands. And when I began to ask questions about it, my mother would you know, send me books and things. Was she one of the old timers who said they wouldn't they wouldn't give up secrets, they wouldn't tell you, they wouldn't explain. Definitely my grandmother was one of those. Uh, whenever she had things that she didn't really want us to hear with, uh, when she was talking to her sisters or her family, it was in Hawaiian. Mm -hmm. And we, we you know, we'd catch a few words here and there, but not the deep, the deep meanings of them. And in mom and dad's time too, they were in products of the 20s, 30s, 40s. Uh, it wasn't talked about as much. They knew that these, even though we visited Iolani Palace, Iolani Palace in the 60s was some office building. I mean, there were, there were desks and file cabinets and offices in there. It's not the beautiful place that's respected today. It's true. It took the Hawaiian resurgence, the it Renaissance, did. It did. to, uh, to it bring did. to light uh, the, the details did. of history, when and what. It did. It did. And that Renaissance and, you know, the beginning of Hokulea and all of that stuff. Uh, I had classmates, you know, quite involved with all of this. And it, I, I had to ask myself, what, and, and my friends were asking me, what are you doing in Alaska? I said, well, I'm raising my family. H had you planned on staying in Alaska well, indefinitely? I was, I was in Alaska for 14 years. I was in Anchorage. I was in Fairbanks for a 11 years and in Anchorage for three. Very happy. Great job working for the statewide system of University of Alaska um, and freelancing quite a bit on top of that. And um, I took some uh, postgraduate classes there in journalism, had some awesome, awesome professors who encouraged me and believed in me. So you didn't feel a call at that time to go back? No, not necessarily. Not until I read that article on, in AP. You know, and then I, I and then I started pitching ideas to magazines here, well, national magazines, that, ideas that I could do in Hawaii and Hawaiian Airlines. I asked Hawaiian Airlines, "Hey, can I come home and do the story on something on Molokai?" They said, "You're in Alaska. Please do a story for us up there." So I pulled out those three interviews that I had in my files and wrote about uh, the kupuna there, who are related to people from Hawaii from you know over a hundred years ago. And so I started pitching more and more. Those were the days that you'd, you'd write a query letter and mm -hmm. put it in an envelope and send it off, or at the most fax, because we didn't have email. Mm -hmm. And darn if you, know, you didn't get phone calls back, or we like that idea, go for it. Here's X amount of time, X amount of money. I like that stuff. <laughs> that was fun, you know? And you're in Alaska, right. and you're concerned about what's happening? Oh, yeah. Every time I came home, my friends here would ask you, you know, what are you doing up there? Besides making money and raising your family and this kind of thing. They say, we need your help at home. I said, what do you mean? What can I do? I mean, good grief. But my, my focus and my interest uh, returned here to Hawaii. And eventually I moved here.
When did you move back? Well, it was after 87, 88, in that area, in that, in that time zone, yeah. When Sabra Koka moved back to Hawaii, she didn't have a specific career plan in mind. She took one step at a time, trusting that the right path would reveal itself to her when she was ready. I had an assignment uh, from a national magazine to do a story on Kauai, and that was one of my transitions. Uh, so it enabled, supported part of my transition, transition home, and uh, I chose to return to Kauai on my return home to the islands. Uh, Did you know anyone, have a job there? I had some friends there. It was, it was really, it was the beauty of Kauai uh, that, that I said, this is where I want to live. This is where I want to make my contribution uh, for the rest of my days. But you didn't m make a living the same way? You didn't, I mean, well, I so didn't, many things I, changed. Yeah, I didn't want to leave Hawaii anymore. And what I found in Hawaii in the 80s was that there was up, it was almost like there was somebody with a camera behind every coconut tree. So um, the day rates and the pay that I had been getting in Alaska or from national, it just wasn't the same here in Hawaii. And then I realized that I didn't want to do commercial work. I didn't want to do weddings. I didn't want to do portraits and studio, even though I appreciate that and I, I admire good work. I wanted to continue to. Uh, learn and to tell, you know, share stories. And you know, you reach a stage in your life where you ask yourself, what are you going to do? You know, you mean you're in the 30s, early 40s, whatever in there, and you, what are you going to do with the rest of your life? Where are you going to put your energies? You know, uh, can you make a difference? And if so, how, when, where, how, why? You know? And so I, I returned home to the islands and I was, I was, I freelanced for a couple of years. I had some fun projects that I worked on, um, but then I, I was very, very honored and very lucky to uh, be appointed as the first public information officer uh, for Mayor Joanne Yukimura, her first term in office. And through that job, uh, I learned uh, quite a bit about the community. Uh, I learned a lot about protocol, about what to say, what not to say, when to say it and you got connected all over the island yeah, of Kauai. Very much, yeah. When I was working in the mayor's office, there was a, a band of merry music makers that came through during Christmas. They were Christmas caroling, and they were all, all mostly Hawaiian, and they were having fun, and I said, well, who are you people? Well, we teach Hawaiian studies in the schools. I said, oh, do you now? Tell me about that. And there was a woman who uh, worked for them, uh, Wilma Place, who started to come by my desk once a week for weeks, and when she'd drop off something for me to read or she'd tell me about something interesting and I said, oh, this is cool stuff. So she said, well, when you've finished working here, maybe you want to come work for us. I said, yeah, let me think about that. And sure enough, you know, the day after I left the mayor's office, I went to work in Hawaiian studies. Why did you leave the mayor's office? Because my heart was leading me over there to Hawaiian studies. And You'd lived, um, you, you had a Hawaiian upbringing in the mm -hmm. sense of, um, mm -hmm. in, in many ways, but mm -hmm. were you trained to be a Hawaiian mm -hmm. educator no, at that point? No, no. As a matter of fact, my mother was a teacher, and I, as a child, I thought, no way, I'm not going to do that. Look at how, look at, she's always got papers to correct it. She had a long dining table, you know, and there were always projects on that table. And I said, no way, I'm not going to do that. That's too much paperwork. Look at and she's working all the time, you know. But it turned around, and I found my, my calling as a Hawaiian Studies uh, Kumu teacher. I um, was offered a job at Island School, I think in 95, after the hurricane, um, to teach Hawaiian Studies kindergarten through fifth grade. And uh, it's a great schedule because I teach there every other day. And on my even days, then I go and support Department of Education, the public schools. And I have a great job of coordinating the Hawaiian Studies Cultural Personnel Resources, they're called, they're all known as Kupuna and Kumu in the schools uh, all around the island from Hanalei to Keikaha. Did you go to school? No, it's all been on the job training. Uh -huh. I mean, I picked up classes here and there, like I took um, evening classes uh, in Olelo Hawaii in, in, in the language. So at, at this stage in my life, it's also my objective to pass it on you know, to share with the next generation as well. You're known for many things, your lauhala weaving. Oh, I love lauhala. Kapa. I love kapa. Just 
It's I a love beating copper. Of, a, of a job. I mean, you can yeah. beat the copper, but it beats you up <laughs> yeah, too, right? It really does. It's really, it really does. So that's why when I have a project now, I open it up to anyone who wants to learn. So Sabra Koka, who at the time of this conversation in 2016, doubles as a Hawaiian studies teacher at Kauai's private island school in Lihue, and as a public school coordinator of Hawaiian cultural personnel, found her passion and her livelihood in sharing the Hawaiian culture. With her students, she embraces the Hawaiian value of observing silently first, not the Western style of students piping up with questions as they occur. As part of my lesson, um, I always begin with an oli, and there's so many to learn, and then they go to looking, actually the lesson itself, what the basis of it is, but at the end of it I do observations. And my classroom is adjacent to a reservoir, and in that reservoir we have a lai ula, which is uh, uh, endangered, a lai keo keo, the ones with the white head. I have au ku'u, uh, the heron that come in, oh, those are and there's beautiful. fish in there. I mean, there's 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 you know it's tilapia, it's not a native fish, uh, and there's bass in there, but they observe, and I have them record what they observe and they point out uh, butterflies, uh, dragonflies, birds. We have uh, kolea that come on our campus. So our campus, we have two or three, four uh, endangered species that uh, lay their eggs there, nest there. I was always a curious kid and always observant and always asking questions, sometimes too much as a child, because in a Hawaiian home you're kind of raised to not be ni'eli, not be too inquisitive, not just ask what, what, why, 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 everything. Mm -hmm. So it took me many years to kind of Why is that, that anyway? Why? It's, it's why? polite, it's not being nosy. Like, don't ask people too many questions. Oh, oh my God, okay. When I first came home, I was in a halau with uh, Roselle uh, Kali'i Honipua, Lindsay Bailey, right? So I'm getting this uh, new chant that we're learning and I'm asking all these questions. And the answer came back that they don't ask too many questions. The knowledge will be clear to you when you are ready for it. I went, oh man, this reminds me of my childhood, you know? But she was right. And if you just keep quiet and uh, observe, in other words, observe. Listen. But that was very different from how you were trained in the other areas where you lived oh, golly. where you traveled. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, that's Western world, Western side and then Hawaiian side. Yeah. It's like, yeah, be inquisitive, ask your questions. Da, 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 da. Be proactive, right? Be proactive. But this Hawaiian side, which is observe, listen, the answer will come. The knowledge will come to you. The knowledge will come to you when you're ready to understand it. How do you teach? Is that how you feel too? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You do? You yeah, switched? No, no, yeah, no, no, no. I, 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 at different times of the lesson, of different times of the class, there's different techniques, you know. And I, save your questions for the end, or save your comments, I'll give you time. Yeah, yeah. So you're a person of tradition, and then you're completely mm -hmm. open to new ways oh, that yeah. don't conflict oh, yeah. with uh, your values. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I think you have to be. You have to maintain some flexibility or you're going to break. <laughs> you know, someone years ago told me, if, if, you got to do what brings you joy. You know, whether you get paid or not, do what you love. And so when I have uh, high school seniors, whatever, come to me and, uh, you know, need a letter of recommendation for college or need advice on their senior projects, and. That's what I tell them. That's what I tell my grandsons. Find out what it is that you love and follow that path. I certainly have. Mahalo anui loa to Sabra Kauka of Kauai for sharing your stories of keeping Hawaiian culture alive through traditional practices and inspiring the next generation on Kauai to find their own passions. And big mahalo to you for joining us. For PBS Hawaii and Long Story Short, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Aloha hui ho. For audio and written transcripts of all episodes of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, visit pbshawaii.org. 
To download free podcasts of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, go to the Apple iTunes Store or visit pbshawaii.org. I did a lesson recently on Ha, on the breath of life, and I asked the children to tell me what words they knew that have the letters H-A in them. And they were good, they were pretty good. They said, oh, aloha, mahalo, hanale, you know? And then I had them hold their hands to their mouth like this and exhale, I said, what does that feel like? Oh, it's warm, it's moist. I said, that is your ha. Then we continued and I said, where does it come from? The air, oxygen. I said, where does that come from? Oh, the trees, the plants. So they're making these connections. And then I had them blow bubbles because they could see it. And it was just a fun lesson. It was a quick and fun lesson. But uh, I think it's important that our children know that they have a place here in Hawaii, that they have a purpose here in Hawaii. And it is my hope that the children that I teach grow up to appreciate the beauty that we have here, the unique communities that we have, the unique cultures, and that they want to come home and take care of the place. <laughs>